Good evening, it's Pastor Schmidt of Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church in Litchfield, Illinois. It's during the time of the uh, shelter in place orders from the governor. We're not going to allow that to stop our being able to worship our God, to hear his wonderful message of forgiveness of sins for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We may not be able to gather together at this point, but we can certainly uh, make accommodations otherwise. So this evening we will follow the order of compline, kind of a, a varied order as I have some additional things to add. Out of the Evangelical Lutheran Hymnary, it is page 128. Page 128. Office of Compline. We begin with the versicles and Gloria Patri. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who Amen. made heaven and earth. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your anger toward us. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, I have sinned against you through my own fault, in thought, word, and deed. For the sake of the suffering, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, Forgive me all my sin, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. We sing hymn 267, again from the Evangelical Lutheran Hymnary. Shepherds pour the Lord most 
time, the one great shepherd was revealed. All glory for this blessed morn, to God the Father ever be. All praise to the O Virgin born. All praise, O Holy Ghost, to Thee. We read the lection reading we would have read at the regular Lent service. Jesus suffering before the secular authorities. Then the whole multitude of them arose and bound Jesus, led him from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. Then Judas, who, was, who betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned to death, felt remorse and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to that. And he threw down the silver pieces in the temple, departed and went and hanged himself, and he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, because they are the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought them with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. And it became known to those dwelling in Jerusalem, so to this day that field is called in their own language the Keldama, that is, the field of blood. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. But the Jews did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which was spoken, signifying or which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. The chief priests and elders began to accuse him vehemently, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus stood before him and answered, Are you speaking for yourself, or did others tell you this about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. The chief priests and elders accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. Do you not hear? But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. And he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt, and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. And the same day Pilate and Herod became mutual friends, before, for before they had been at enmity between themselves. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, the people, said to them, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, 
You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence, I found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, nor did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing worthy of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. And at the feast the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And there was at that time a notorious prisoner named Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison with his fellow insurrectionists, who had committed murder in the insurrection made in the city. And a multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. And when they gathered together, Pilate answered, You have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, the king of the Jews, who is called Christ? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders stirred up the people and persuaded them that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? The whole crowd cried out, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, spoke again to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they cried out more exceedingly, Crucify him. And they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. The voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and soldiers of the governor took Jesus in the praetorium and gathered the whole band of soldiers around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown out of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him and began to salute him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face and spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, you see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and upon our children. Then he released to them Barabbas, whom they requested, who had been thrown in prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Jesus, after he had scourged him, to their will to be crucified. Here ends the lection reading. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. 
For you have redeemed me, O, o Lord, God of truth. God of truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. And we continue with a scripture reading. Today is March 25th. That's nine months before Christmas. This is the day that we celebrate the Annunciation to Mary. The day that the angel came to Mary and announced to her that she would give birth. We read Hebrews 10 verses 5 to 10. Therefore when he came into the world he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We also read for the Gospel reading, Luke chapter 1, verses 25 through 38. Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. Now in a sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. As we celebrate the Annunciation, we always keep in mind God's preparation for Mary, that she was going to conceive a child. Not a child according to the law, not a child according to the way of nature, the way that God created it. But a child would be born in this world by promise. A child of promise that was given to the first parents, Adam and Eve, after the sin. After the fall into sin, God, in his condemnation of the devil, said that he would send a savior. That he would put enmity between him, between the devil and the woman, between her seed and his seed. He will crush your head, you will bruise his heel. So the people of God were prepared through the ages. God prepared the people with the prophecies. And with the prophecies of through Isaiah and many others through the Old Testament, the people were being prepared for the sacrifice of the Savior. Mary is being prepared. She's being prepared for the birth of the Savior who has come to come into the world. And she's being prepared also for what is to come to that Savior. For our Savior had come to suffer and die and to bear the sins of the world. To be fulfilled were the prophecies such as in Isaiah. Who is believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And our Lord Jesus Christ, as we read in our election reading, was being prepared. The final preparations were being made for the Savior to lay down his life for his people, to lay down his life for our sins, to lay down his life so that our sins could be paid for, the ransom could be paid. God's wrath and anger could be stilled for it would be carried on on his son in whom there was no deceit, in whom there was no sin, who had done nothing wrong but was bearing the sins of the world. This final preparation being condemned unjustly to death. The innocent laying down his life. The final preparation has been made, has been made before he bears his cross so that he can suffer and die. God prepares us for death. God prepares us for death through the preaching of the word, through the right division of the truth, which is the preaching of the law and the gospel. He prepares us for this in baptism and Lord's Supper. God prepares us for death. God prepares us for things that are going on right now, where we see sickness and disease all around about us. Some of us may even face it through this current disease, this current pestilence. We don't know, but it's okay. People run about in fear. They're scared. They run to the grocery stores and buy all kinds of things out. They fear one another. They have panic in their hearts. But we as Christians can fear not. God has prepared us for this day. God has prepared us. He has prepared us in his love. He has prepared us by telling us, I forgive you all your sins. Yes, someday you are going to die. Yes, someday you're going to have to face that time. When your body and soul separate. But Jesus says that if one believes in me, he will never die. Even though he dies, he will never die. You're like, what do you mean? You'll never die. You're dead. You're corpse. Your body's going in the ground. But we are but asleep. Our body goes to the grave to rest, and our soul goes to the Lord. The body returns to the dust from whence it was made, and the spirit returns to the Lord who made it. We have promise after promise from God of the resurrection from the dead, that day when our bodies and souls will reunite. Those who believe will be taken to life everlasting. Those who do not believe will be cast into hell. We may be tempted to think, well, we don't deserve hell. But everybody deserves hell. How arrogant can we be? A lot of people think that Christians think that they're so good, that they don't do any wrong. We sin. We acknowledge we sin. We humbly admit this before our God. We plead with God, for Jesus' sake, forgive us our sins. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We know we've not done the law perfectly. We haven't loved God above all things. We don't trust God above all things. Not perfectly like we should. We may be able to endure these kind of crises better than a lot of other people. But still, there's a little bit of fear. Maybe a lot of fear sometimes. There's worry. What if I pass it on to one of my loved ones unintentionally? What if my parents die? What if my grandparents die? worry. Worrying is idolatry. We may take the name of the Lord our God in vain as we seek about trying to find answers and find truth 
and we listen to some of the charlatans who go about saying all kinds of things, all kinds of false doctrine, making all kinds of false promises, going around with all kinds of op apocalyptic doom and gloom prophecies as well. We may get wrapped up or tempted to wrap or get caught up in these things. We don't always remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And how awful, awful it is that in this world today, the way it is, and with the disease that's going on, our government's not even recognizing the need for this. There's no accommodation for us to be able to gather together around the means of grace. Rather, it's being forbidden. I know that they are looking to science for their answers. And so they would pray to their God of science, not really pray, but putting all their hopes and foundation in that. Whereas we need to gather together to have our confidence built and strengthened in word and sacrament. And we have the other side of it. The fourth commandment of honoring and serving our parents and superiors. It's all too easy to criticize very harshly the government in all things. To condemn them outright. To not put the best construction on things. It's, it's almost impossible. Nay, it is impossible for us to do this perfectly. To be holy as God himself is holy. To love our neighbor as ourselves. Even with this disease that's going about, we're being put in a real tough predicament. Are we really not putting our neighbor's best interests at heart if we go out and about? Some would condemn us as though we are, but then again, are we being flippant and being reckless? Are we taking chances that we shouldn't take? Are we doing needless things and not preventing this disease, not taking the steps that might be necessary, might be helpful, might be the very thing that's needed to help stop the pestilence, to preserve our life and the life of our neighbors. And then we have, of course, all the commandments, all ten commandments. We could go on and on and pick apart each particular one. We sin against God's word in thought, word, and deed. And it's why God prepares us. It's why God prepared the Savior. Why he prepared him to come and stand as our substitute. To suffer under the law. Because we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. We skipped the verse. Please the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. God prepared him to be the Savior for us. God prepares us through the means of grace. When you're tempted to despair, when you're tempted to be, uh, to feel hopeless and helpless, remember in your baptism and the promises given therein. Return to it in daily contrition and repentance. Remember that God promises that baptism doth now save you, that it's a washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. This isn't some mere obedience of God or some covenant relationship being fulfilled on our part. We'll always fall short with that. This isn't about works. This is about God's promises and God promises there. God promises that whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Hear that blessed, wonderful absolution of the forgiveness of your sins. Treasure it. God's preparing you for these very days. Here are those promises connected with the Lord's Supper. It's a new covenant, a new testament. 
What's that New Testament God tells us in Jeremiah? I will forgive my people their sins. That's the New Testament. And he says flat out, this is my blood of the New Testament. Or this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Whichever way we have it before us in the text. Either way, it's telling us this is the New Testament. I'm pouring out the forgiveness of their sins. You're being forgiven for your sins. That means that we survive death. Even though we die. We never die. For those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. So God prepares his people. He prepared the people for the coming of the Savior. He prepared Mary for the coming of the Savior. And he prepares us for the coming of the Savior, for Jesus' return. These are the things we celebrate and remember during Lent and celebrate and remember during Holy Week, which is to come very shortly. May God ever give us that confidence and that strength through these difficult times. May these promises ever shine, shine forth before us. And may we ever be able to cry out our praises to our God. Cry out in thanksgiving to Him. Rejoice in Him. And not have the fear and the trembling that the world has. The world trembles before death. Death has been defeated for us. We trust God. We trust His promises. To Him be the glory now and forever. Amen. We continue again with the Office of Compline. We're on page 128 in the Evangelical Lutheran Hymnary on the top of the right-hand column. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O well, Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come to you. We pray. We beseech you, O Lord, pour forth your grace into our hearts, that as we have known the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, by the message of the angel, so by his cross and passion we may be brought into the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. We also pray, Holy and mighty Lord, who has promised, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. We beseech thee to hear our cry for those who are suffering and dying under the visitation of disease. Mercifully bless the means which are used to stay the spread of sickness, and strengthen those who labor to heal and comfort the afflicted. Support those who are in pain and distress. Speedily restore those who have been brought low. And unto all who are beyond healing, grant thy heavenly consolation and thy saving grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, visit this dwelling and drive far from it all snares of the enemy. Let your holy angels dwell with us to preserve us in peace. And may your blessing be upon us evermore. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Preserve us, O Lord, while waking, and guard us while sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, Lord now you let, let your servant depart in peace, according, according to your Lord. word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. Preserve us, O Lord, while waking, and guard us while sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
the Almighty and most merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.